It's a pleasure to be here and to have been invited to speak at this 40th um, anniversary year. Uh, this uh, talk I have here is um, not particularly original, uh, but what it, w what it hopes to do in quite a few slides is to introduce the subject of uh, astronomy in terms of comets and then go through the uh, current paradigm of comets uh, very quickly actually because I imagine many of you are already familiar with it but to highlight uh, towards the end some of the problems of comets and then at the right at the end indicate perhaps how um, maybe not the 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 um, community at large, but at least some of us think how some of these problems of comets might be solved, and in terms also of addressing the issues of uh, cometary um, events in the sky. You know, these are the this is the real puzzle as far as I, I'm concerned as a scientist, because the problem uh, that we face is that there appear to have been changes in the sky happening over historic or proto-historic times, which which, the like of which we don't uh, or we haven't yet observed in terms of modern science. And so the problem then is to see how it is that such events could have happened potentially and yet, um, uh, uh, you know, in, and to tie it into a proper theory of the solar system. Uh, the problem being, in a sense, that it's very easy for astronomers to compute orbits nowadays, very easy, uh, in terms of having a computer program that does the job for you. Um, you can compute the orbits back thousands of years with some precision these days, unless there happens to have been very close approaches to planets or something. And, and so if there had been a big change in the sky, even within the last 10,000 years, then there should be some remnant of that effect, some fossil, some signature, still there in the solar system. And that's, a, that's there, in some sense, a puzzle. If, if it's very hard to find such a remnant, then you find this, this uh, problem that whatever one thinks about the historic record and the near, near, near record going back five, thousand years or more, um, it's very difficult then to tie it into a proper theory of the solar system. So in a way that's what uh, I, I'm trying to do along with my colleagues uh, Bill Napier, Duncan Steele, David Asher, uh, Victor Klub and others. We're all trying to see how this can be made to fit into a proper scientific theory whilst in, in, in a sense not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So the, that's the general aim and so if, if you'll bear with me I'll, I'll run run through some of these slides quite quickly, but if I'm going too quickly, please don't hesitate to butt in, say stop, hang on, or do, and equally don't hesitate to ask questions uh, as well on the way through, because I don't want to be losing anyone, uh, but I'm conscious of also of the time. So let us look at some comets. <clears throat> Comet Donati, here we've got a nice picture of the curved dust tail, as it's now known. Uh, and whenever you see a feature like that, an, an amorphous structure, that's always due to the dust component of the comet. And just to put, give you some background, the nucleus of the comet, I'm sure you all know, having seen the pictures from Rosetta and um, much earlier, the Giotto spacecraft from Halley's Comet, uh, that uh, the, the solid component of a comet is thought to be a dirty snowball or an icy dirt ball, depending on your uh, preference. And it's basically a, 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 mi a, a mixture of dust and, and ices dating back to the age, the origin of the solar system, probably uh, some four and a half billion years ago. And as the uh, comet comes in from uh, the home of the comet, the Oort cloud, uh, which is stretches out uh, actually more than halfway to the nearest star, then those comets, uh, the, those ices sublimate as they get warmer within the inner, I don't know, uh, few AU, few astronomical units, a few times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Uh, they get warmer and then they sublimate. The, the major component is water ice, but there are other more volatile ices which are detected through sublimation of comets uh, and um, even, you 
see on Pluto as well, uh, from uh, much farther out in the solar system up to about 30 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. The other component of the comet is the coma, which is the, the, ga ga the rapidly expanding atmosphere of dust and gas coming off from the central core, uh, the nucleus. The nucleus is typically a few kilometers or tens of kilometers across, sometimes they can be much bigger, and, and the coma is order of magnitude the size of the sun so it can be huge as you can see compared to the tiny thing in the middle that's the source of all the activity and then you have these very straight components of the tail which is due to the gas uh, tail the ion tail as it's caused so that get the dust and the ions the the gas component of the comet it, are moving in very different orbits once they're ejected from the nucleus Here's another picture, a couple of pictures of Halley's Comet. Here you see a famous deconnection event, as it was called. That's the ion tail. And here you see these, these smooth features in the image, which are all produced by the dust of the comet, a different uh, sort of outbursts uh, uh, leading to different density com in, in the tail and so on. So, and here's the nucleus as imaged by the Giotto spacecraft. And it's around about 16 kilometers long and about eight in each dimension across. And it's a very, very dark object. Uh, I, I work at the Armar Observatory, as you many, many of you may know, and, and here's a picture that I took of Hale Bopp, and you probably can't see it with the lights on, but maybe you can just see the gas tail, and the, the gas tail is already going straight up, and the curved dust tail, and that, for many of us, was a great comet, which we still remember, uh, like a fisherman's tail, really. The more we remember it, the bigger it gets, and, and uh, so there you uh, have it. But um, I'm sure that's a common human uh, issue where we think of things in the past and that they become more and more important as, as time passes. Um, and then another interesting comet, Shoemaker-Levy 9, and this illustrates a comet running into a planet. It, we would never have guessed to, in our lifetimes to have ever seen that to happen. If you'd have asked an astronomer before 1992, how often do comets of a kilometre size run into Jupiter, they might have said once every 2,000 years or so. <clears throat> However, in 1993, this object was discovered. It looked like a, I don't know, a squashed something or other, banana or something. And, and then when you look at it under high resolution, you may, it was made up of a number of cometary fragments. And after a few weeks, it was determined that these fragments were not in heliocentric orbits, in other words, orbiting the sun, but were actually in Jovi-centric orbits. So somehow or another, this comet had got trapped into an orbit with a two-year period period around Jupiter and it broke into fragments uh, and, uh, it, and, and the fragments were uh, on a two-year orbit around Jupiter so they were moving with Jupiter around the Sun but at the same time orbiting the Jupiter a bit like the moon uh, moving with the earth around the Sun but the moon orbiting the earth uh, with a roughly a one-month period and so what, what we now discovered was that the fragments were destined to run into Jupiter at the next perijove, the next pericenter of the orbit. And that did happen uh, the following year. So they were discovered in March 93, and by July 1994, they'd all disappeared because they'd run into Ju Jupiter. And these are the atmospheric scars. And there are a couple of lessons from that. One is you can't trust an astronomer because <laughs> they simply, the observations keep changing and then the, naturally the astronomers with their theories catch up. Uh, the other thing is relatively small fragments, these are about half a kilometre across on the average, uh, produce atmospheric scars that are quite long lasting. And the atmospheres of the giant planets aren't that different in scale, height and so on, uh, to the atmosphere of the Earth. So if a half a kilometre size object were to run into the Earth, you can probably imagine that it would produce a scar, a dusty, dirty, sort of opaque object in the, in the Earth's atmosphere, covering the whole Earth, effectively, and that would lead to a, a global uh, catastrophe in terms of climate change. So when we're talking about the impact of comets on the Earth, uh, the canonical one kilometre asteroid would be damaging over the whole Earth, but so would half a kilometre comet running into the Earth. One would, 
one would extrapolate from this sort of example. And I'll, I'll come back to this, mo this comet in a, in a little while to explain how it got into that orbit. Um, and so from the observations, there are a number of cometary end states. One is simple disintegration. So the comet, it's a kilometer size object in space. You'd imagine it would be quite strong, um, but it appears that it's not. Uh, at least some comets aren't strong. And here's an example of one coming th into the solar system. Uh, and as it was approaching or going away, I can't remember in particular for this comet, it, it broke up into a number of fragments, a bit like the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet. And each of the fragments became little mini comets in their own right. And in the end, the thing sort of disintegrated. And you, it, looks to, it looks as if it's going through a dense medium, but it isn't. It's going through the interplanetary medium, which is very low density. And there's no real pressure to be concerned about here. It's just internal processes, probably triggered by solar heating, that's caused that thing to start breaking up. And then there's the, the um, much more obvious example of just outgassing. So if you have a snowball, you see it in your backyard, you make a big snowball, it gradually sublimates away, and until you've got a little heap of dust, that's all that's left of it. And in the same way, this is what happens as comets periodically go around the sun. Every time they go near the sun, they release more gas, and ice, uh, sorry, dust, and, and the dust particles leave little trails of dust behind the comet, which produce sometimes meteor showers if they run into Earth. Uh, but the gas is left as the gas tail, and it, gradually the comet is shrinking. And on average, comets which pass within the Earth's distance to the sun lose about a meter or so of material. And so that sort of tells you they can't last forever. And then this interesting example of sun grazers. These historically are the brightest comets uh, in the sky. They are bright because they get very close to the sun and therefore they sublimate, sublimate like mad, producing a massive amount of dust and gas, which you see as a, a very bright tail, very bright feature. Though in, when they're close to the sun, naturally, they're very hard to see because it's daylight. But you nevertheless, uh, that these are the comets that in many cases have stuck in the historical record. So these are sun grazers and, and their evolution is the same as that for other comets but, but writ large because of the extremes of temperature uh, uh, and I suppose pressure as they go through the inner parts of the sun's atmosphere. Um, I, I mean the inner parts of the corona here and, and, and so on. So there, that's another end state. And the end state is a bit like that for the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet, ultimately. Sometimes comets with pericenters, perihelion distances, in this case, close to the sun. Some of them actually run into the sun. And that was a new discovery about, um, well, I suppose, 20 or so, 30 years ago, when um, the satellites which were designed to look at the sun uh, discovered a whole lot of comets running into the sun sun grazers as they were called, and, and uh, tiny comets, not the big ones. And it was a great puzzle as to how that would be, because again, it, had you asked an astronomer how often do random comets run into the sun, they might have said once every few hundred years, like 100 or 200 years or so. And, and then suddenly, when the observations came out, there were little fragments of comets running into the sun every few days several times a week. And, and uh, there are now a number of subcategories of these sun grazers known. And it turns out that what's happened is that a larger uh, component uh, of the, each of these subgroups of sun grazers has gone close to the sun and fragmented. And so you have a kind of a giant meteor stream in the, in the solar system. And when that happens, each of the comets has a small perihelion distance and the fragments are running into the sun. And you just have to thank goodness that uh, the meteor stream from the big sun grazer uh, comets, aren't, none of them happen to run into the Earth or cross the Earth's path. Because if it did, then we would have suffer the same kind of bombardment episode every time the Earth, in its annual passage around the sun, passed through the trail, which would be interesting, uh, to say the least. And there might not necessarily be kilometer-sized fragments, that would be rare and unlikely, but uh, even tunguska size objects coming around every 30th of April or whatever day it happened to be, then uh, it would be an interesting uh, phenomenon uh, and, and one no doubt that everybody would, would want to, us to deal with.
So what are the questions about comets? They are very diverse in their properties. Uh, I've explained to some degree what they are, but the diversity means that some comets are almost inert, more asteroidal, if you like, than comets, and others are very large, uh, more like um, icy planets, if you like, Pluto or sub, sub size of Pluto. So, so that's the question. Uh, do you have, uh, are we dealing with one ensemble of, of objects or are, they men, are there many uh, or do we divide them into several categories? How are they formed and where? Uh, I suppose the standard picture, and there's no real reason to diverge from this, is that they are associated with the origin of the solar system. And so they were formed somehow to do together with the sun and the planets four and a half billion years ago, approximately. And, and then, uh, and where? Somewhere in the outer parts of the protoplanetary system. In other words, beyond the region where it was too hot for ice to survive. And that probably means beyond, beyond about the distance of uh, Jupiter, uh, beyond the asteroid belt, certainly, and out, be out to maybe 30, 40 astronomical units or beyond. And again, that leaves you plenty of scope for devising theories of comets where the ones that form close in could potentially be different from the ones that form far out, if only, for example, in their chemistry or, or dust properties. But on the other hand, it might just be a continuum. And anyway, if they were different when they were formed, the dynamic sort of mixes everything up anyway. Um, how do they die? Well, we've talked about um, the various physical mechanisms. Uh, dynamical ejection is a very common uh, process. And here, the, uh, the rule of thumb is that a comet coming in from the Oort cloud, a very distant home of the comet, if you like, where the comets are stored, they are, on average, uh, mostly ejected. So one comet comes in from the Oort cloud, it, it goes around the sun, it gets a disturbance in its orbit owing to the effects of Jupiter and Saturn principally, and it's got nearly an equal probability of gaining energy or losing orbital energy, and when that happens, uh, half of those comets coming in with nearly zero energy, zero binding energy, uh, are ejected, and half of them are captured in tighter more strongly bound orbits and those that are captured come round a second time and then they have another chance to be ejected or to be captured into more tightly bound orbits and then those that are that have that second pro um, evolution, they come round a third time and have another chance to be ejected or to be trapped and, 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 and to lose uh, some gas and volatiles in the process. And overall, around about one in a hundred of those from the initial Oort cloud end up uh, surviving, in quotes, in, as, or, as, as really short period comets, the sort that we call Halley types or Jupiter family type of comets. And the 99% or more get booted out. And so the solar system is actually a strong source of interstellar comets, whether you like it or not. And, and so the interstellar space, it must be, if, if the solar system is in that sense at all typical, it must be full of large uh, members, uh, icy objects like comets. Uh, and then I mentioned collision with planets like Shoemaker-Levy 9, evolution to, a, to either nothing or, or an inert end state. And there you get the idea that the dust which is entrained with the gas when it sublimates, uh, some of that, those dust particles don't quite lift off to infinity, and so they fall back onto the surface and leave a kind of dusty crust on the comet. And then it becomes a, a, um, an insulating crust, and the ices might then be uh, capable of surviving the perihelion passage simply because they're not warmed enough during the uh, orbital uh, period around the sun. But there's some pictures of comets. There, these are ones that have been viewed by spacecraft uh, a few kilometers across. But don't get misled, because the, these are typical comets which we've observed. They're all different one from another. That's important to note. Uh, but also, it's, it's also important to note that these are not representative of the larger members of the population, simply because those large members are much uh, rarer and haven't yet been uh, detected by spacecraft. <clears throat> So I don't want to go into too much in detail about the origin of comets from the Oort cloud, but the standard picture is this. Maybe I'll move straight on with modern data and look at the right-hand slide, slide here. Uh, the point really is that when you observe comets, 
uh, long period comets, which come in more or less randomly from any all directions in, in the sky uh, at a rate of about, shall we say, one a year or something. Then you look at their energies, their orbital energies. So zero is a parabolic orbit. Over here you've got an elliptical orbit and increasing, um, in, uh, how can I put it, uh, decreasing orbital period going off to the right. So here your periods are millions of years. Here's a semi-major axis of 1,000, so the 1 over A is 0 0.001, and, and here is well, 0.002, and so on. So if the semi-major is, is 1,000 astronomical units, then the period, uh, according to Kepler's laws, is that to the raised to the 3 half power. And uh, if you can do that in your head, you're better than I am. But anyway, it's, it's measured in thousands of years. And, and, so, uh, and so something of the order of there is 10,000 year. Here we've got a million or 10 million year period. And over here, shorter periods. And the key thing about this histogram is that there's this spike. So it's called the Oort spike which is indicative that the comets have come in for the very first time in their recent history and coming in undisturbed by planetary perturbations. And the, the underscore original there, orig, means that the orbits as observed have been corrected for the known effects of the planets as the comet is dropping in. So you're, so you're, uh, you're plotting the original orbits as they would have been uh, undisturbed by Jupiter. And basically the argument which, uh, which goes on is that, uh, well, how do you explain that diagram? And the only argument that works really, uh, and I won't dwell on this, uh, is that uh, the comets, are, because of the narrowness of the spike, these comets must have been coming in effectively for the first time. And then how do you make that happen? Are we lucky to be seeing comets in the history of the solar system because that, uh, those comets coming in with periods of 30 million years uh, or less, uh, that is a long time, but it's not long compared to the age of the solar system. So had, that, had the Oort cloud in some sense been primordial and not ever disturbed, then after 30 or 60 million years, all those comets with orbits directed towards the sun would have been gone, because 99% of them are booted out every uh, during the course of their evolution dynamically, and the rest just fizzle out due to decay, um, uh, loss of get volatiles or covering by inert dust. So you lose them, and, and therefore you have to explain how you still see comets. And Oort's argument was, well, actually, there's a, th it's not just radially directed orbits that are in this cloud. There are orbits of all kinds, all directions. So they're all elliptical, but their velocities are in all, direct, all possible angles and directions. And, and, and then there is an effect which disturbs those orbits so as to keep a replenishment of the nearly radially directed ones. And he pointed to the effects of passing stars, stellar perturbations, which which uh, in 1932 had also discussed. And in that case, in that way, then th this explains why the, the, the swarm of comets as a whole, which numbers around about 100,000 million comets, is able to replenish those which we see which are being lost. So either comets are a transient phenomenon, which we don't like, or there is a primordial quasi-steady state picture which, uh, it, which people tend to like. And then there are a number of other details about the theory, which I won't dwell on here. Um, but just to uh, imagine the view of the Oort cloud, imagine here you've got a, well, here you do have a globular cluster of stars, and the density distribution of the stars is greatest in the middle, and it falls off towards the outside. And now imagine that these white dots are comets, and the scale is not parsecs, but now, well, tens of parsecs perhaps, it is no, it's not even that big, it's like the solar system. So there's the sun in the middle, and the outer limit of this is halfway to the nearest star, which is about one parsec. And this is then imagining that, that to be the shape and structure of the Oort cloud. So really you have a swarm of comets moving with the sun and the planets around the galaxy in, the, in its uh, orbit, and, and, and then you have occasional passing stars whizzing by, 
uh, at typical speeds of 10 or 20 kilometers a second. And then, uh, then what happens is it disturbs the orbit of a comet like that, which is in a very highly elliptical orbit, which has a chance to come close to the sun. It disturbs the orbit very slightly in order to disturb the pericenter, the perihelion distance, so that it does come close to the sun and we can see it. And uh, for every one of those then that goes in and we see it, we, it gets booted out uh, mostly. But then the disturbances of the passing star on neighboring orbits brings others in to um, uh, replace the ones that were lost. So there's a steady state flux going on of comets. And here's another picture of it. This is rather um, a, a misleading image, but only because of the logarithmic scale. Um, the inner parts, are, are, there's no comets, well there are a few obviously, but they're driven out by planetary perturbations, so it's, a, it, it's like a polo mint, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a swarm of comets with a hole in the middle, and, and, and the, then beyond Saturn's orbit, 10, and beyond the edge with Kuiper about 50 to 100 or 200, gradually the distribution of comets flares up beyond a couple of thousand astronomical units into what here looks like a shell but look at the scale from 1,000 up to 100,000 and so it's a it's more like a spherical uh, cloud of objects and this is the region from where the comets are observed to come around about 20,000 AU from the center of the solar system. So I don't particularly want to go through the theory of the Oort cloud, it's just, except to say it's a nice theory. It's, it's mathematically attractive to certain types of people. Um, and, and so you can build models of the Oort cloud, and then you can explore uh, those models and see what the implications are. For example, um, you might want to consider models where most of the mass is in the central regions between say a thousand and ten thousand astronomical units and the outer shell from where the comets appear to come the outer region is uh, a much less massive component and conversely you might want to consider models where most of the mass actually is in the outer regions and only a fraction of the mass is in the core uh, and whichever of those models you think is more physically attractive in terms of a picture where the, the Oort cloud is formed in an early part of the solar system, early stage of the solar system. So you can have those um, different kinds of model and then the Oort cloud has to survive for the age of the solar system so then the argument becomes one of how, how does it survive against all the vic vicissitudes of galactic history. For example the sun ploughing through spiral arms or molecular clouds or occasionally massive stars going near the solar system. All of those things disturb the orbits of the comets and can in fact lose comets from the solar system as well. So just to summarize what happens in a, in a sort of cartoon way, when the solar system was formed, everything was in nearly circular orbits, much more so than uh, they, the comets in the Oort cloud, and then uh, passing planet, well, planets' perturbations principally disturbed the orbits of the small bodies, uh, which didn't make planets, into more elliptical shapes, more extended orbits, but still with pericenters near the planet, and then a nearby passing star, maybe a fragment of the original star cluster from which the Sun was born, passes by and it disturbs the aphelion part of the orbit and that with a lever effect produces a change in angular momentum and increases the pericenter of the orbit lifting it away into away from the planets and therefore into the safety in quotes of the Oort cloud. So there you are, you have lots of comets now in the Oort cloud and then the reverse process goes on passing stars drop some comets down to small perihelion distances with pericenters close to uh, Jupiter and Saturn and the Sun and, and then the reverse process happens and then you eventually find comets appearing to come in from the Oort cloud. So what goes on beyond, uh, well, beyond the planetary system and uh, between that and the Oort cloud is, is still, well, not quite so speculative as it was at this date in 1964. Uh, Whipple and others had, had speculated that there would be a ring of comets beyond Pluto. Um, nowadays we know there is a, a, a very complex region of the solar system beyond Pluto called the Trans-Neptunian region, and this region uh, between 30 or so 
astronomical units and out to one or two hundred astronomical units is now accessible to observations uh, by powerful telescopes and so people are beginning to unravel some of the complexity of those orbits and they're not all circular some of them are quite highly elliptical and of course there are some objects like comets coming transiting through that region all the way in towards the inner solar system and, and so we get to a consensus picture and you, I don't need me, me to tell you this, always be wary when there's a scientific consensus. But on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, yes, it may be true. So uh, you always have to be careful. So the post-1990 consensus basically thinks that uh, comets are not that interesting anymore. Uh, but we know all about them. We know how they're formed in the solar system. Uh, yes, there are some sort of detailed questions still to be answered how that works but basically we know the general picture and comets are primordial solar system bodies made by coagulation of interstellar dust grains originally during the formation of the solar system and then afterwards during the evolution of the protoplanetary disk so you make bigger and bigger objects and this pro coagulation proceeds more quickly in the inner parts of the system because number one it's denser and so collisions are more frequent and number two the orbits are shorter period so collisions are more frequent so the two things act together to make things happen faster in the inner parts than in the outer parts and, even, and Kant in, uh, in the middle of the 18th century knew that and, and later stages then you have planetary protoplanetary collisions planetary migration all the sort of stuff which um, maybe as recently as 20 years ago was not rarely considered by uh, professional astronomers the idea that the present solar system is not like that which pertained at the start and that's a very interesting question and all a lot of this is to do with how do you grow the outer planets fast enough and also how do you explain the phenomenon known as the late stage bombardment or the heavy bombardment on the moon which occurred it seems around about half a billion years after the formation of the moon and the terrestrial planets so there are some sort of issues of detail which lead astronomers down a number of different paths work on comets focuses on number one the dynamical evolution particularly of the short period comets both Halley type and Jupiter family the Halley types having periods uh, ranging up to a couple of hundred years and the Jupiter family tending to have lower inclinations in other words moving more closely in the plane of the solar system and having periods maybe up to about 20 years or so and then you simulate the origin of the solar system in order to make an Oort cloud and then you compare the simulated Oort cloud with observations of the few thousand or well, less than that actually a few hundred comets uh, in order to see uh, how well it reproduces those observations and all you can really do by such a process is develop a consistency argument you can say that starting from these conditions I end up with something which is consistent with observations and consistency arguments aren't that great at proving that chain of argument is unique so one always again has to be slightly slightly careful there uh, in in terms of saying for definite we understand things what we like to do is to find simulations which really rule out certain hypotheses for cometary origin and then there's a number of newly discovered types of objects centaurs are the ones that particularly interest us um, these are objects, um, Chiron was the first one to be discovered, which orbit between the, uh, roughly speaking, Jupiter, so they've got pericenters beyond or close to Jupiter, and aphelia as large as you define them. Um, so some people define centaurs as having elliptical orbits which are orbiting around the sun suppose you see a little arrow there that's the sun so imagine the elliptical orbit of a centaur like that it's it's orbiting between the orbit of Jupiter sorry the orbit of Jupiter and the orbit of Neptune <laughs> so they're, they're like that if you can imagine that right and and the other people like myself and my colleague Vacheslav Emelianenko in Russia and others who've worked with us we tend to call centaurs anything which has a pericenter beyond Jupiter and an aphelion distance not quite as large as you like 
but as uh, out to about 2,000 astronomical units. And there's a, so there is a distinction. There's no really uh, agreed nomenclature for centaurs, unless you did a poll, and then you'd find the majority of people would have a view. But uh, it doesn't, science doesn't quite work like that. Um, the structure and evolution of the trans-Neptunian region, then, is, is the other issue, because that can be a source region for centaurs, and centaurs can be a source region, in fact, are, is, a, is a source region for um, uh, Jupiter family comets and others, and the Edgeworth-Kuiper belt beyond Neptune, and trying to work out how that, what constraints does that region of the solar system, which is, as I say, now accessible to observations, what constraints do the, uh, do the properties of the objects there impose on theories of the origin of the solar system? But to come back to the puzzles, um, what are comets? Well, now we've got further distinctions. Long period and short period comets, are they different one from another? Are they the same diverse, broad spread of properties, a single population, however, or is, is it kind of bimodal? And do the properties of the comets depend on their characteristic orbits, whether very long period, like from coming from the Oort cloud, or Halley types versus Jupiter family, or whatever? And the answer there is the jury is still largely out. Um, most people, and here I, I mean the consensus, think that the Jupiter family, the centaurs, and so on, the Edgeworth Kuiper belt, or trans Neptunian type objects, are all much of a muchness in their properties, whereas the long period comets, the Oort cloud objects, and the Halley types are a different population. Uh, I personally don't like that, and, and anyway, to be awkward, we tend to say, well, let's explore the alternative hypothesis that comet is a comet is a comet. Uh, there's not a unique uh, body, of course, because of the diversity, but then you would say that the, these guys are all, it's a simpler picture in principle, these guys are all much of the muchness, the same objects, they just differ in their dynamics and in the history of each particular object. Uh, how are they formed and where? So these two things come together. Um, are they formed in the protoplanetary region? In other words, in the region from roughly Jupiter out to Neptune, uh, and, and allowing for all the planetary migration and so on that people nowadays talk about? Or are they formed in the much more quiet part of the solar system beyond the protoplanetary region, beyond Neptune, in the region from maybe 30 to 50 out to 100 or so astronomical units. And there's no reason to, reason to think that uh, growth of particles stopped at the outer boundary of the planets, um, uh, in principle anyway. And so maybe a large number of comets did form in a different part of the system. And then people sometimes still consider the idea that comets can be built in a molecular cloud or even in interstellar space, in different kinds of environment. And, and those pictures, although they might not be entirely um, applicable to our solar system, one should never reject them because there are regions of the galaxy, certainly these are probably valid regions where you can grow uh, from icy, dust, dusty interstellar uh, particles covered in frostings of ice, how they can come together to make bigger objects in space. And then the proximate sources of comets, well, Oort cloud versus trans-Leptunian disk, Edgeworth Kuiper belt, scattered disk, call it which you, which you may. Um, and what is the structure and evolution of the Oort cloud? Because if it's going to be a proximate source, then it has to evolve from the origin of the solar system to the present day, and a large number of comets in it have to survive for all that period of time. And so how was this structure formed, and does it contain most of the mass, most of its mass, in a massive inner core, stretching from a distance of maybe 1,000 astronomical units up to maybe uh, five or 10,000 units? And in that case, I suppose, uh, that's still a region of the solar system that we know almost nothing about. The comets are still very far away from the sun. They're very, very dark, 
faint I mean, um, and, and it's, it's virtually impossible to, to see any objects unless they were exceptionally large and there'd be very few of those if, there, if any. So the, I, that region is a real dark, uncertain, terra incognito part of the solar system, the so-called inner core of the Oort cloud, and all you can say about it really is based on theory of how the Oort cloud fa was fa formed and how it evolved. It would be good if it did contain a lot of objects because then, it could, then the inner core could be the reservoir for the dynamically unstable outer region. Uh, but that's still not proven. And then uh, the, what is the role of these newly discovered bodies? Because every time you discover a new class of object, it's going to impose its own constraints on the overall system. So you've got centaurs, Edgeworth Kuiper Belt objects, trans-Neptunian objects, and so it goes on. And, and, and to try to classify these objects is another goal, if you like, of observational astronomy. Uh, you'd look at the surface properties, you look at the colors, you look at the albedos, that's the, how dark they appear to be. You look at the gases coming off them, uh, polarization and so on. So there's lots of work going on in that, that area. And then of particular importance for this talk, what is the cometary mass function? What's the average mass of comets? And what is the total mass of comets in the solar system? And this hinges on the question of the slope of the mass distribution. So in general terms, most object, most, in most systems, in, in the solar system in particular, uh, there are more small objects than big objects. Maybe that's natural. It seems natural to you. I hope it does. Uh, and so the key then is whether there are so many more small objects than big objects that they actually have most of the mass of the whole system. And in that case, when you see the small objects, because they're more numerous, uh, you've seen the whole lot, basically. Uh, but on the other hand, if the mass distribution is flatter, then there is always an outlier, a bigger object, than, which basically holds most of the mass. And then the question is, where does this distribution turn over, if anywhere? And so the question of the largest object determines the average mass. And, and it's quite often in science that the result of this sort of power law is one way or another, is close to the situation where the more objects you find, you keep discovering a bigger object, and that raises, if you like, incrementally the average mass. And, and so the number of comets might not change hugely, but the total mass keeps changing because you discover or you add in more and more r rare but big objects. And, and that's an important thing, because the comets we've observed over what you might call recent human history, uh, even if they come in at the rate of one a year, that means you've only seen a thousand or so de decent-sized comets. And if you need to see 10,000 before you see a big one, then it's a kind of a critical uh, fact that we haven't yet seen the biggest comet and so we're in a situation where one can speculate that uh, okay, oh, maybe there are big comets, there are big centaurs because these objects have sizes ranging up to hundreds of kilometers across. What would happen if such an object popped into the inner solar system in its normal uh, random evolution? And then we come to the issue of comets being fragile or strong and their end states, and what's the impact of comets on the Earth and the Sun. The issue of fragility and strength, um, I'll come to in a moment. Um, if, if, you will, if you can still bear with me, what I want to do here, I don't want to go through all the steps of making comets, but I do want to emphasize two uh, extreme kinds of... Basically, this is coagulation from initially interstellar dust grains formed in the atmosphere of cool stars, ejected into the interstellar medium, and then cooked in the interstellar medium, uh, processed through hot uh, material, through, processed into cold clouds, where f frostings go onto the stuff, and then uh, sputtering and all the rest of it, chemistry, and then many cycles of evolution. And the bottom line is that cometary material is a, has a cosmic chemical memory of this whole pre-solar system uh, history. So that's another reason why astronomers are interested in getting samples of this stuff, however it arrives to Earth. <clears throat> 
And then there is the protostellar disk phase, where the grains in the disk grow and grow and grow, and, and uh, with the dependent on the ices at a particular distance from the sun, the comet will contain uh, a memory of that material. And then, I don't know how good you are at, at crossing your eyes. You only get, can you fuse those two images together, these two? <laughs> Uh, if you can, then you should cross your eyes and, uh, and you should be able to see the 3D structure. Well, if you can't, it doesn't matter. You can imagine the 3D, 3D structure. And you get a very friable sort of m structure of material with lots of holes in it. And so the average density is less than the density of the individual grains by a large margin. Um, and then you have the protoplanetary disk phase. And after, at this point, what's going on is that the gas in the protoplanetary disk has been expelled by the evolution of the sun, uh, formation of the sun, and so on. And you're left now with making planets out of effectively a dust disk. And a good rule of thumb is that the surface density of the disk, you know, column density, is around about 10 kilograms per square meter at 10 astronomical units, which is a good rule of thumb. If the disk is a, what we call a minimum uh, mass disk, in other words, the minimum material that you need in or of cosmic abundance that you would need to make uh, the stuff you see. And, and then the grains grow very quickly in the inner parts of the disk and much more slowly farther out. And although not a def definite formula, uh, an approximation to the speed is that the grains grow much faster at small heliocentric distances than at large ones owing to this cubic power. So in one million years, the grains can grow up to a size of the order of a meter at 100 AU, well, 0.3 of a meter, 30 centimeters. And whereas if you're at 10 AU, it would be 1,000 times bigger, 300 meters. So you can see how, how things grow much more fast in the inner parts of the solar system. And that's probably the reason why you only get planets in the inner parts of the solar system and much smaller bodies may be still there in the outer regions of the trans-Neptunian region zone. And, and so you have that uh, growth of, of particles, and then either that goes on in the standard planetesimal model, where they basically collisions, collisions, collisions all the way, or you have a local instability, local gravitational instability picture. And, and the advantage of that model, which I just want to draw your attention to, because it's not a favored model, and maybe it doesn't really work either, but who knows, is that uh, if you're beyond the region of the planets, the collisions damp down the velocities of the dust particles to almost nothing. And, and when that happens, there's a kind of a critical uh, mass. Uh, if, 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 velocities are, have a, if the particles in the system have a certain velocity, and, and, and then if you, if you have to go out to a certain size, in a, effectively such that the, the random velocities are less than the escape velocity from the size that you first thought of. If, if, if you're looking at a very tiny region with a lot of random velocities, then that tiny region would never collapse to make anything. But if you move out to a big enough region with a big enough mass in, enclosed within it, then these velocities are, sm uh, are smaller than the escape velocity from the whole region. And, and beyond that, then collapse can occur. In a disk, um, system, there is also to be taken into account the fact of the shear of the disk. So that's the particles going faster in, in the inner region and more slowly farther out, the Keplerian shear. And so when you take account of that, then there's a critical uh, mass uh, above which you can't get collapse as well. And so you've got a critical mass below which you can't collapse, and a critical mass above which. And, and uh, that means when those two things agree, then that's the mass of the first fragments that you can form. And it turns out very neatly that there's a, there's a formula for the mass of the planetesimal or the comet that you will make in such a system, which involves almost nothing except the surface density of the disk and the heliocentric distance. And that's what I like about it. <laughs> 
and it gives roughly the right answer for centaurs so, uh, and trans-Neptunian regions. So I, I tend to think what probably might happen, and it's an interesting one, that uh, far enough out in the solar system, the disk did, did fragment into sub-disks, and then those sub-disks made um, single or multiple objects evolving rather similarly to a large disk as a whole, but many of them. In, in that case, anyway, whichever way you take, you, on the one hand, the, the protoplanetary, maybe it's the next slide, um, yeah, the, the, uh, in a, the conventional picture would have accretion of objects in the planetesimal uh, regime uh, going on all the way down to planets and, and comets being a sort of debris of that. In that case, comets will have undergone a, a fairly robust process of early evolution where collisions were important. In the alternative picture, the comets are coming together much, are growing much more gently. And that's really the point about mentioning the two pictures. I don't want to talk about Pluto particularly, except to point out the scale sizes. So somewhere there's a picture of Pluto. That's, there's Pluto. And that's a couple of thousand kilometers across. So there are lots of objects, Sedna, or oh, all the different names, of the order of a thousand kilometers across in the outer solar system. And some of those objects must occasionally drop into the inner solar system unless their orbits are very special, like those of that, that of Pluto. In other words, protected by some resonant interaction. Um, so, so there are large objects in the solar system. Uh, and I don't want to talk particularly about the instability of the Oort cloud, but I do want to draw your attention to how the galactic tide as a whole drops comets in. Remember, in Oort's theory, there was um, a, a statement that the thing that disturbs these very highly eccentric orbits is the passing stars. And these give the comets at aphelion, farthest from the sun, a nudge. Uh, a velocity of delta v in technical terms, and that delta v times the length of the orbit gives you a change in angular momentum, and therefore that changes the pericenter of the orbit. And, and there's another effect which does exactly the same thing, which is the tide, the tidal effect of the whole galaxy on, on the comets. And, and the way to imagine the tide, well, maybe I'll just do go back couple of slides. This is the effect of the stars. So there's the sun and there's the comet, a distance r from the sun, so some distance removed from the sun. Here's a passing star and it gives the comet an impulse and it gives this the sun an impulse. And it's the difference between the two impulses which determines the change of velocity of the comet relative to the sun and it's that which determines the change of the orbit and so when you come to the galaxy as a whole it's the same game here's the how can i look at it here's the galactic plane this table <laughs> and the and the point is the distribution of stars above and below it is less den less density up here than there is uh, in there and less density low down below uh, as, as you'd expect. And then the Sun and the comet, wherever they happen to be in relation to the disk, the, the Sun being, let's say my thumb is the Sun, then the thumb is more strongly attracted towards the, the plane than the comet being farther away. <laughs> so there's, again, there's a differential effect called a tide. So it's that effect which is producing the galactic tide, and it dominates the flux from the Oort cloud, it turns out. And then there's another complicated-looking formula, but the key to it is that power of semi-major axis. So the change of perihelion distance per revolution in the Oort cloud is proportional to the semi-major axis to a high power, the seven-halves power. And that is why you only see comets coming from a great distance, because in the Oort cloud, the delta Q per revolution is maybe five or 10 astronomical units. But once you get inside about 20,000 astronomical units, this power has killed it. And so the delta Q is tiny and you need a bigger effect to change and therefore to draw comets in across the orbit of Jupiter, which is about 5, and Saturn, which is about 10 AU. And now another point, I, I, I convinced you, I hope, I didn't really explain it, but I probably 
I probably did convince you that this spike tells you most of the comets are coming in for the first time. And basically what goes on is that uh, the comets come in for the first time, they're then scattered by Jupiter according to some Gaussian distribution of energies like that. Half of them get booted out, half of them get trapped, and then the ones that are trapped come in again here, half of them get booted out, or quarter maybe, and, and some more get trapped, and then they, they move down to there, and then they come in again, and some get lost, and some get, and so it's a diffusion process. And, and, when, you, and when you do the sums, you predict how many comets there are here in the distribution. The truth is it's like that. So sadly, the Oort cloud picture doesn't quite work, it's, it's a power of 10 difference. And, and that means there are a lot of comets in this part of the distribution which should be there, which aren't seen. And that's called the fading problem. And it's still not resolved because we don't understand what the comet structure of the nucleus is and quite what's going on. Presumably, the comets coming in there seem to be two ideas. One is that the comets coming in are much brighter than they should be for their size because they spent so long out in the Oort cloud. Uh, and the other is that they are, uh, are um, going away and disappearing, breaking up, disintegrating, whatever it is. So you have the two, uh, the two different pictures of the comet. Either they're strong and very volatile or, or they are very, very weak and fragile. And that's, that's really the, the heart of the fading problem. I, I don't, and, and where are the dead comets, therefore? And, and the, the bottom line is this, that if you say one comet a year coming in is converted uh, by, with a probability of 1% into a Halley-type orbit with a period less than 200 years, and then if you take into account the lifetime of such an orbit in the solar system is around about a third of a million years, then you can write down the steady state number. The number in the steady state is one per year times 1% times 300,000 years, which gives you 3,000, which is around about 100 times more than is seen. So that's the fading problem again. A lot of things should be there which aren't seen. And, and uh, I, won't, I, I don't have time to go into all of these small discrepancies with the uh, current theories. Um, but I do want to, and as I say, I do have uh, copies of these, the, the slides, if anyone wants them here. So it's easy enough to look at them later. Um, the fading problem is intrinsic to comets generally. The other point is the dynamical evolution is very interesting and complex once you take account of long timescales. And, and one of the points here is resonances, where the particles don't seem to change their energies, semi-major axis being plotted here very much, and then there's a big change and then it pops into another flat period, another flat period and so on. And, and the other one is the perihelion distance can sometimes evolve all the way down from about five or six astronomical units, in this case for Halley, all the way down to nothing, dropping into the sun effectively in the future. So, so three things. One is resonances are important, which mean motion resonances where the comet goes around a certain number of times, which is linked to a, a, a integer, integer ratio with the number of Earth years. Kozai cycles uh, correlate um, the inclination of the orbit and the eccentricity or pericenter. And these Kozai cycles which often drop things into the sun. And, and, and that leads to the concept of sun grazing being a ubiquitous end state rather than a rare phenomenon. And if I draw the attention back to um, Shoemaker Levy 9, it, it's a general, the Kozai cycle is a general dynamical effect. It occurs in, in, with any axisymmetrical gravitational system. In the case of the Macoltz, for example, this is a heliocentric comet orbit, orbiting the Sun. In its case, the effect is that Jupiter's going around like that, effectively a ring-like system of mass, and Macoltz, which is in a perfectly ordinary orbit like that, uh, is able to evolve 
into a horizontal orbit, flat orbit, if you like, but in the time it drops into the sun. And it's the z component, it's the perpendicular component of its angular momentum that's conserved, which does that. And in, in the same case, this is what happened with Shoemaker-Levy 9. The um, proto-Shoemaker-Levy 9, whatever it was, nobody saw it, it came into an orbit that was, and it was captured by Jupiter into a two-year orbit. And then it got into one of these cycles. So it was now in a Jovi-centric orbit. So if you're sitting in Jupiter watching this comet go around every two years, the sun is going around Jupiter every 11 or so years, 11 or 12 years. And over enough years, it looks like a, a, a kind of a sp spread of matter, a ring-like distribution. So again, you've got that axis symmetry. And in this case, the, ax the perihelion distance, or perijovian distance in this case, of the comet was destined to fall into Jupiter. So it's the same kind of effect. The galactic tide, too, another mechanism to drive large pericenter orbits into the Sun. Uh, I don't want to do all of that. Um, but I do want to, uh, maybe I should just um, focus, I, want to get, I, I do want to get to the last part of the talk, you see, and I'm conscious of the time, but I do want to say um, about this, whether comets are one or two different types of object. Comets are very diverse, but the question now is, are they the same object, or are there two or more subtypes? And the standard view, again, presenting the consensus view, is that there are at least two subtypes. The two subtypes are the following. The Jupiter family comets come from centaurs on this picture, which in turn come from the scattered disk, which is mostly uh, just beyond Neptune, but with relatively high eccentricities. And they come, and, and on the other hand, the uh, Halley types originate from the long period comets in the Oort cloud, which themselves probably originated in the Jovian region uh, of the protoplanetary disk. Following from this picture, it turns out that in order to match with observations in the simulations, the Jupiter family comets have to be very strong and long-lived. And so they last more than a thousand revolutions, maybe up to 10,000, but not more. Whereas the Halley types from the fading problem have to have a very short lifetime, less than around about 100 or 200 revolutions. So that's the standard picture, and you can see how the fading problem comes into it. Not only are there two distinct types of comet, one long-lived and long-lasting, there is another class which basically fade away. And, and uh, yet, when you, if you were to take a picture of a comet and ask which type is it, from its spectrum or whatever, it'd be very hard to say uh, ab, initio, ab initio, whether it was a Halley type or a Jupiter family. So, so there, there is that problem. The other view, which I tend to subscribe to, is that uh, all comets are, are the same. In other words, not identically the same because of the diversity, but a comet is a comet is a comet. And they're formed in the outer region of the heterogeneous protoplanetary disk, and then all the other parts of the solar system slot in, the Oort cloud, the flattened, dense inner core, and so on. And they are all fragile. And they have short active lifetimes, less than 200 revolutions. And then you can explain a lot of other stuff. But the fragility is important. So um, this is a, a, a more of a summary slide before I get on to the last bit. And, and the last bit is just coming now. Um, general points. Comets, as you all know, uh, are sometimes the most prominent objects in the sky. So if anything in the sky is going to attract people's attention, it's going to be the sun, the moon, the planets, the comets, the bright ones, and the fireballs. Not much else uh, uh, that we're aware of. And, and, and their study goes back thousands of years. They touch on many areas of astronomy, as I've tried to indicate in this review, uh, not least solar system science, but also the structure of the objects in the interstellar medium, for example. And they have had a significant impact on the Earth, both physically and in the sense of the development of scientific ideas. We are now aware that Earth is an open system, 
in touch with its near space celestial environment, which, now, which is actually a reflection of a very ancient idea. And this paradigm shift, which we've, we've all lived through, is, as, in my view, as significant as the paradigm shift that moved us from a geocentric universe to a, the, the one where the Earth is a perfectly normal object orbiting a perfectly normal star in a perfectly ordinary galaxy. So that's a big system. The Earth is not a closed environment moving, evolving under its own uh, uh, complicated history with a constant sun above it. Everything is open. Um, the solar system is very leaky. We talked about comets being ejected into the interstellar medium. So too with dust. Um, the modern picture of comets now becomes a balance between the historic catastrophist uh, viewpoint and the Newtonian uniformitarian view. And it's very interesting to see how the subject has has uh, mirrors over the, nowadays uh, the debates that were going on two or three hundred years ago. Comets both as destroyers of life and as the objects that bring the necessities of life. And so comets are both bene benevolent or, or horrible things, uh, destroyers. And that's now thought to be the standard picture, which is a view that people argued about for many years. And now um, ancient history, however, brings in, now if, you, if you're prepared to talk about ancient history, which uh, many of us are, then it suggests, uh, as I mentioned at the start, that the sky might have been significantly different in those days, whatever those days means. Several thousand up to maybe several ten thousand years. Interplanetary debris, more bright um, meteors, uh, more comets, bright as a zodiacal light. If that is true, how can it be? That's the, that's the question for a scientist. How can you really explain it happening so relatively quickly in time, a few thousand years? Cometary masses range up to the size of Pluto. Uh, what, are the, what then, seems to me, is a logical thing to ask, what would be the effect of an occasional giant comet dropping in to the inner solar system? Admittedly on a time scale of 100,000 years, but nevertheless occasionally would happen. And what's the average mass of a comet comes into that? Are all comets the same or different? Well, we've talked about that. And what's therefore the total mass of the Oort cloud? Uh, it comes in because you have to form it as a consequence of your theory of the solar system. The fading problem comes in because if comets are disintegrating, fading, whatever it is, what happens to their mass, the cometary debris? And meteor streams um, uh, come, uh, are coming from the dust of comets are very fine-grained, at least over the first tens of revolutions, and, and therefore strong time dependence is possible in the accretion rate of dust and small bodies on the Earth uh, soon after the bodies were released from the comet. So, so just to wrap up in five minutes or so, I want to whiz through some of these points which... I'm sure you're, many of you will be aware of uh, as, as, a, as an argument anyway. Um, we can read the literature of comets in the 18th century uh, as a kind of a watershed between a very ancient view of the sky and a modern scientific view. Uh, this is the advances in, in understanding. Um, there's been, however, a more or less continuous strand of interest, and I've mentioned in comets from the earliest times right up to the present day, and the business of comets as agents of destruction, catastrophism, versus the idea that they are the bodies which bring all the good things to Earth, including the oxygen, the water, and so on, necessary to sustain life. And so we now have this new paradigm, which is reinventing a very ancient uh, combination of, of, of ideas. Um, I don't want to go through particularly why we study astronomy, but I do want to point out that we live in a rare golden age where the various strands of interest in astronomy, uh, the philosophical, religious strand, the spin-off practical strand, and the, if you might like, the pure science of astronomy all come together at the same time. So we're living at a very unusual period 
where there are almost unprecedented and rapid advances in observations, in turn driving such changes in theory and the ideas underpinning general picture of astronomy. And, and then, now let's look at the history of interest in the sky on Earth, and it goes back to um, several thousand BC, um, the Eastern view, uh, at least it goes back to that period. It goes back to the Western view where we have the Greek uh, flowering uh, and the people like Thales of Miletus and so on, developing early cosmologies which, w which we still recognize as being vaguely scientific, which I've called here the Western view, a thousand years later. And, and just to explore some of that, the Western view, Anaximander, for example, He's, he, he describes, it's almost as if the Greek philosophers lost it in terms of the physics when they were talking about the sky. And that suggests they were handing down knowledge which they really weren't certain about. Um, they had no direct observations perhaps, but they nevertheless were sure enough that some things were very different from what they were immediately visible. And the, nothing puzzles me more, if you like, than Anaximander's surreal picture of of the celestial bodies. Basically you've got this picture of hoops of fire where you have little holes in and the fiery stuff is spurting out of the hoops of fire and these are the stars or these are the planets and these are the meteors, whatever it is. Where does that image, where does that visual image originate from? And I'm not going to give you the answer because I don't know but it's a question to me. And then um, Probably many of you will know more than me about early developments of astronomy in this sense. But when you look at the way that um, humans have responded to events in the sky, there's a very early period which we can describe as judicial astrology, where um, events in the sky, it is self-evident that they affect events on the ground. And if you'd ever lived near Tunguska, you would understand that. And if you lived in Chelyabinsk, you would understand that, uh, and so on. So we have nowadays some hints as to how that might that that influence could be, uh, as 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 you as it were, commonly accepted as as fact. And and the idea is that the sky gods are announcing events on Earth through. Uh, a code which we still had to understand but through the appearance of a comet or a bright meteor or by the fall of a, uh, a meteorite or a thunderbolt hurled by Jupiter. Well nobody's ever seen a thunderbolt hurled by Jupiter, it's impossible, but what, where does that idea originate from? And then you, you see a kind of transformation of ideas towards zodiacal astrology where this sort of effect is transmitted as having its origin in the zodiac, which is the region of the sky occupied by the planets. And then you have the whole business evo evolving into uh, horoscopic astrology, which none of us, I hope, believe, maybe you do, um, but I don't, uh, is based on the entirely false premise that wandering planets exert a controlling influence on human stars. But something exerts a controlling influence on human affairs, or it did, and maybe might again in the future. And it's also interesting to me to note, nobody's yet shot me down, um, that this astrology provides an early example of a powerful but magical scientific concept. A powerful concept because we all talk about science, science, scientific theories, action at a distance, and we, we swallow it perfectly happily. Uh, but there's no nothing in my knowledge where action actually happens at a distance. My, my voice to you is being transmitted through the pressure waves of the atmosphere into your ears where there's more, more local effects. So action at a distance is a bit of a misnomer and, and yet it's a very powerful concept and one that few of us think about. we just told it works for gravity or whatever. And, and all of this astrology, the value of it, is that it motivated. It motivated people to observe carefully the planets in their motions, to make predictions. So a sort of scientific thing, uh, although it went off into a dead end. 
and it demonstrated that there was an increasingly possible scientific approach to what otherwise would seem to be a random cosmos in which we were just plotsam and jetsam in amongst the changes of the natural environment. So, and it led to the focus on unimportant chance alignments of planets and so on. But it's been remarkably hard to shift. And in the last few hundred years, we have what we might call scientific astronomy. And, and just to put in your mind how the old stuff might have worked, or, um, it, you see the prophecies, the omen literature, is always of this characteristic form. If something is observed, then there's some terrestrial effect. So if a shooting star flashes as bright as a light or as a torch from east to west and it disappears on the horizon, then the army of the enemy will be slain in its onslaught. So what can you conclude? Is that people are saying, well, if that, I mean, the army was slain when that happened, and, and uh, if it were to happen again, it would be a good time to have your battle because that what happened last time, which is actually quite a scientific way of doing things. If only you, you know, it's a bit like uh, old wives' tales with the weather, stuff like that. And maybe there's a, 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 a grain of truth in it. And Seneca, who nearly became emperor, gives uh, some insight into this. He talks about us rational Romans and the Etruscans who preceded them in that part of the world. Whereas we, uh, rational Romans, believe that lightning is caused by clouds colliding, they, on the other hand, believe that clouds collide in order to create lightning. And since they attribute everything to the gods, they are led to believe not, if, not that events have a meaning because they have happened, which would be our kind of view, but that they happen in order to express a meaning. So the people, this gives us some insight, I think, into how early peoples might have, reviewed, might have viewed things. So moving both closer to home and uh, far slightly earlier in time, megalithic astronomy, which I call the Atlantic view, there's the midwinter sunset, um, from Stonehenge. Here's a picture of uh, some uh, rock art on a tomb quite close to where I live. Uh, all sorts of fascinating stuff there. And, and if you're prepared to indulge in some speculation that it could well just be, maybe I can blow one of those up a wee bit. Can I do that? Oh, look, I can. Um, you can. You can see this one here. Looks a bit like a comet, doesn't it? With its tail. Can you see that? <laughs> It could look like anything, I, I agree, but it, it looks a bit like a comet. Uh, and there it is again. And, and this one does look like a tree, sorry, a comet. Uh, and you can see the stuff. And this one is telling you to look up at the sky, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, there are always, everyone will look at these things differently. But on the other hand, if you can find a scientific theory which explains how things in the sky would have been different as recently as 5000 BC or something, then this takes on a whole new uh, meaning, I think. So, and then if you look at the rock art, as lots of people have researched it, I know, um, uh, and you can again begin with the eye of some faith, detect cometry-like uh, symbols. Don't know what that is. That's not a comet, that says. That's a deer, right? Okay, but I'm not saying everything is cometry. But, but look at that one. And now look at the next feature, or the one up next one. This is the Chinese classification of comets. You can easily see connections between these, uh, how can I put it, untutored images of, of, of comets observed and, and across the, the range of time over which different people have left a, uh, a record of them. This is Donati's comet, the head of it. This is uh, the great comet of um, 1861, not too unlike one of those other comets. Here's Halley's comet. So you could, with, it's easy to see how these things would be images of comets, though, not, though it's only a consistency argument, it's not a proof. And again, looking at some photographs of the heads of comets. And now an event which we're familiar with, the Tunguska event. Uh, here's uh, the 1947 Sikoti Allen meteorite form. And again, you can begin to see how these things can be tied up into uh, untutored reports from uh, earlier times of events in the sky. And I'm nearly finished. Um, this is Tunguska again. 
Uh, this is the Russian down-to-earth scientists who have left a, uh, a totem pole uh, at the ground zero with the, with the mythology that you have to go there and you leave something of value to yourself at the foot of Akbi, the Siberian god who brings fire to the forest. You can't see the impact. The trees, fallen trees have mostly rotted away. But um, nevertheless, people from my, like me say, travel thousands of years on a pilgrimage to lay a bus ticket at the foot of Akbi, and in the hope then that I might come back. And then, of course, there's the physical effect that we know about, that sometimes uh, large objects run into Earth, changing the course of the evolution of life on our planet. So there's the big story. And, and so um, Neugebauer argues that ancient astrology can be much better compared with weather prediction from phenomena observed in the sky than with astrology in the modern sense of the word. So he's saying don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Here's another uh, look at these comets on the ground. And uh, this is Bakemore stone circles in Northern Ireland. A very interesting and unique site, I think. And, and so the last slide is, is, I think, this one. And, and here I return to the question of the zodiacal light and the, uh, and, uh, the Milky Way. And the, again, again, highlighting the, the importance that of the, the fact that sometimes um, people can get the wrong end of the stick and they can transfer ideas from one topic to another. So you always have to be alert to that. You don't want to say, yes, they were talking uh, absolute truth. You have to be aware but to say, well, what could they have been referring to, which, could, which we can interpret nowadays in terms of our modern scientific picture of the solar system. So Anaximander, again, describes stars as like the lighted jets of gas spurting out a punctured hoop of fire. Well, either he was off his rocker, or he was talking about something which made sense to him. And if, if, it, did, if it does make sense, the only sorts of things that do look like that would be fireballs or meteors or stuff like that. Aristotle, he taught that the Milky Way lay in the sublunary zone. In other words, the Milky Way is below the moon, and it's a hot accumulation of the disintegration products of many comets. So where does he get that idea from? Anaximander, uh, the stars again, An Anaximander again, the stars lie below the sun and the moon. Well, they don't all do that, for sure, because the moon can occult stars. But, but on the other hand, some stars do. And again, you may be talking about meteors here. And then Metrodorus and Nipides, uh, the Milky Way is the former path of the sun. And the Anaximander uh, and Democritus, none of them intellectual slouches, the Milky Way lies in the shadow of the Earth. So, if you know anything about the solar system, this is the zodiacal light, and it is the path of the planets and the sun and more or less the moon in the solar system. If you were to crank its brightness up by a power of 10 or more, then basically what you'd be doing is increasing the density of dust in the solar system and then there'd be a lot of um, brightness there you go out at night the first thing you see is this pillar of light behind where the sun set and a, 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 brand, a broad band of light over the sky and it seems to me that that when that faded you'd be left with just the picture of the milky way and so you could easily see how that transference of ideas might happen if phenomena like the Leonid meteor storm were more common in the past, years ago, than they are now, or were then even when the, these Greeks were writing, then it, you can begin to see how the idea of stars lying below the sun and the moon might be uh, originated. And I'm kind of conscious that I'm not, probably not giving due credit to everybody in, in this field because people have had these ideas over many years. Uh, but the key to me is to try to find a physical mechanism by which this could actually be proven. And that's not as easy as it might seem. So you could still throw it all away, say it's bunkum.